Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started, so we can go back to our seats. Um, so I'd like you to welcome back um, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who's uh, obviously the professor of um, sustainable development in Columbia University, but also it's going to be a conversation uh, with Pat Brown, the CEO of Impossible Foods. So I'd like to give you give them both a warm welcome, uh, please. Thank you. What do I say? Pat. Great. Very nice to meet you. I got to ask, how many of you have had an Impossible Burger? Wow. Wow. All right. Get a picture of that. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold up your hands. Wait a minute. As of today, you can buy it at uh, Fairway. Um, Raise your store. hands. Impossible Burger. OK. <laughs> cool. Mm. Wow, I love that. OK. You too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Pat, thank you. You gave me my first hamburger in 25 years, uh, actually, <laughs> as, as I told you earlier, because I uh, went uh, off hamburgers in 1993 uh, and went back on hamburgers with Impossible Burgers uh, when, when uh, you brought them to market. Could you give us an update, in, including uh, the launch you were just uh, uh, telling me about uh, backstage? Um. Sure. Well, I don't necessarily assume that everybody here know, knows the backstory, but basically, uh, you know, Impossible Foods has been around for uh, um, about eight years now, and and we were founded with uh, uh, the mission of completely replacing animals in the food system by 2035, um, and doing so the only way that I think could possibly work, which is um, not asking people to change their diets, but making it our job to figure out a way to produce uncompromisingly delicious meat that delivers everything consumers want and has to outperform in serving consumers meat from animals uh, um, so that we can compete in the marketplace, basically, and remove the economic incentive for covering the planet with cows and, and, and all the catastrophic impact of that. Um, we launched our first commercial product three years ago in New York City um, in a restaurant. We've now scaled to about 17,000 restaurants across the US and in uh, three international locations in Asia. Um, last week, we, we've always just been in restaurants. Last week, we launched in a grocery store uh, for the first time in LA, um, in a small chain, Gelson's, if you know LA. Uh, today, we launched in uh, Fairway and Wegmans, uh, which was our East Coast launch. And, just the, big, the, the latest update, and I'm going I'm to shut up because it's turn in, turning into a spiel, but the... Um, we need your spiel, so it's okay. <laughs> the, um, the launch in LA, um, three days in, we got a report from the, uh, this chain that it was their biggest launch in 50 years. We outsold uh, meat from cows um, every single day in every single store. Um, and, uh, and our product was the um, best-selling package product by a huge margin, more than six-fold more sales than the second best, which was a dozen eggs. So, um, so it was super successful for them. So we're very happy with it. And I think it's going to be equally successful in New York City. So go to your local Fairway store and check it out. Can, can you? Uh... Very interesting uh, linguistic twist. Uh, meat from plants and meat from animals. Mm -hmm. Can you justify that and explain? I mean, oh, yes. It's, it's, a, it's a clever marketing point. Is it a valid point, a valid way to discuss this? Well, as I always say for all of these things, it's basically we don't get to choose. It's, 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 it's ultimately consumers get to, get to decide. But, but um, yes, I think it's completely valid because um, we've talked to lots of meat eaters. And actually, I'll, I'll take a poll from the audience, OK? Um, I'm, I'm assuming, no judgment, the vast majority of you are regular meat consumers. The same is true of 95% of the people buying possible burgers, by the way, have, have consumed meat from animals in the previous uh, month. So and that's all good. Let's but do a the, quick survey. How many of you do not eat meat? Okay. Wow. 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 We. Uh, yeah, see? We have to change that. OK. <laughs> um, 
but, um, but what we found, and I'm interested to, to hear your opinion, is, well, let me ask the question, okay. Um, how many of you love meat because uh, you love its unique, delicious flavor and the protein and iron and the convenience and versatility, familiarity, stuff like that, among the meat eaters? Okay, probably the majority. How many of you love the fact that it comes from the cadaver of an animal? <laughs> with all the environmental impact associated and health issues, zero. No, no hunters out there, hunter-gatherers? <laughs> no. I have to give you a statistic. Cause I, 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 somebody once asked, asked me this question like, okay, maybe we should just go back to hunting. And, and just to give you a perspective on that, um, you know, there's a, there's a meltdown in biodiversity right now that we are in a very far ex advanced stage of. The total number of wild animals living on Earth today is less than half what it was 40 years ago. Very well documented, and it's across the board. Mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, even invertebrates, okay? And they're, they're, this is based on a long-standing study. Overwhelmingly, this is, it's virtually entirely due to the use of animals in the food system. Fishing, hunting is a very small factor, and the, and the catastrophic um, destruction of, of habitat by the land footprint of animal agriculture, which is 50% of Earth's surface. And as demand grows, notice the Earth isn't getting bigger. That's why there are fires in the Amazon. That's the secondhand smoke from your burger. That's, that's kind of the situation that we're in. Anyway, that, that is the driver of this biodiversity meltdown. But sorry, I went on a rant here, but, but the hunting thing. So someone once asked me, oh, maybe we should just go back to hunting. Well, if you do the math, it turns out that if you produce the meat supply that the world currently consumes by hunting wild animals, there wouldn't be so much as a shrew or a sparrow left on Earth in two months. Every single wild animal on Earth would have been consumed for food. That's, that's how big the demand is and how ridiculously beyond the scale that our planet can support. The cows on Earth outweigh every remaining wild animal, uh, wild vertebrate uh, uh, um, living on land <laughs> by more than a factor of 10, okay? Cows outweigh every remaining wild terrestrial vertebrate remaining on Earth by more than a factor of 10. It's the most wow. horrific invasive species you could possibly imagine, wow. and it's crowding out all the biodiversity um, with its huge mass and the voracious demand for, for uh, um, you know, food and land and water and so forth that goes with it. So... Um, can you, can you give us, uh, just like this, but uh, a few key quantitative points of the difference of, going, of having a zero meat economy in 2035 from having a business as usual in terms of whatever oh. scale, whether it's greenhouse gases or land area or oh. other impacts? Such an interesting question. And, 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 Sometime I'll talk offline about this because that's exactly the right question to ask. It's, it's, the, there are two traje trajectories that you're choosing. Um, what, what do they look like in, in 10 years? It's very hard for people to imagine this thing and getting it, getting it into their minds is really important. Okay, so um, again, like a couple of statistics. Um, will you need to just you know, grow a lot more plants if you're replacing uh, animals in the food system with plant-based products? No, and it's kind of self-evidently no, because a, a large fraction of all the plants that are cultivated on Earth are used to make pigs and cows and chickens. And in fact, the world's entire soybean crop occupies 0.8% of Earth's land area. And just, just it, another interesting statistic to me who geeks out on these things, all the fruits and vegetables um, grown on Earth occupy 0.7% of Earth's land area. Um, and animal agriculture, 50%. Um, but um, that soybean crop contains 160% of the human usable protein um, that's contained in the world's entire meat supply. In other words, you can match all the protein and all the meat consumed globally with less than, with 0.5% with with, with of Earth's land area growing soybeans. The problem is, and that's the reason why the company was founded as a science-based company, is nobody wants to eat soybeans instead of meat. And so um, that's the reason for this whole catastrophe. This is the biggest environmental catastrophe in history, is the 
catastrophic impact of, of the use of animals as food technology. So really it comes down to you have to figure out a way to take these vastly more efficient plant-based products and turn them into something that people actually want to eat as meat. But okay, so the, that the land footprint of agriculture will be reduced by more than a factor of 10. About almost half of Earth's land area can, can return to um, be a healthy a ecosystem supporting biodiversity um, that, that right now is basically just barren. Um, secondly, in that process, the um, uh, the minute if you if you made that system go away, if you snapped your fingers and and it went away in an instant, atmospheric CO2 levels wouldn't just stop rising; they would literally start coming down. And um, and you can do the math. And and in in the period of a couple of decades of just recovering the sort of original biomass um, photosynthesis, the best carbon capture technology on Earth, optimized over a billion years, is, um, will, will pull 17 years worth of um, greenhouse gas emissions, the equivalent of that, in carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and turn it into um, plant biomass that supports biodiversity. So there's that. Um, uh, there's, um, uh, in terms of water, this is the biggest user and polluter of, of this industry, the biggest user and polluter of water uh, in the world. So um, the Colorado River hasn't reached its destination since uh, animal agriculture um, took over the western U.S. It ends in a, in a pathetic little fizzle um, in the Imperial Valley in California. Well, actually, for the first time in decades, the Colorado River would flow into the Gulf of California, um, and the same would be true of a lot of waterways that right now, in many cases, basically just end in a fizzle because they're all sucked dry by by the water demand of animal agriculture, or they're massively polluted by uh, um, nutrient runoff, which again is almost entirely due to that industry. So, so those problems uh, uh, would get better. Business as usual, we're predicted that there's predicted to be like a 70% increase in demand for uh, uh, um, animal products in the next uh, 30 years. So, um, globally, so. The earth is not going to get bigger. The supply of fresh water is not going to get greater. Um, the capacity of the planet to absorb the massive amounts of nutrients that are put in the system isn't going to increase. And so basically, right now, in Habitat for Biodiversity, you notice every time you see the smoke coming from the Amazon is not increasing. And we're in this late meltdown. I think we're going to basically have a, a catastrophic collapse of biodiversity, not just, not just wildlife, but the plant life that depend on those flying insects, birds, other species for pollination, for all, all those wild animals for dispersing their seeds and uh, keeping the ecosystems healthy. Um, it's not going to happen, though, because we, we got it. It's, it's all good. But, um, but we don't want that outcome. Sorry. I'm watching the Twitter feed. Yeah. And the, okay. Oh. Could I just ask more? Has yes. that been written up, this kind of comprehensive comparison of the two? Because I think it's absolutely compelling yeah. to I, do so. I, 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 well, yes, it's been written up in massive, unreadable notes that right. I've been um, <laughs> That doesn't um, taking, fully count. <laughs> but, but no, it, it's actually a really good point, because I feel like all the statistics are there. As we were talking be before, for example, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization um, does a, an incredibly meticulous job of, of tracking how many pounds of, you know, uh, guinea fowl are consumed globally and in every country, and um, how many pounds of pigs exist on Earth, and, and every agricultural statistic you, you can talk about. And, and the environmental stuff, there's the, the thing about pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, that's, that's also, there are uh, um, old publications that have calculated how much of the biomass that existed on on land before um, agriculture came along um, uh, that's now in the atmosphere. And so you can just basically do the reverse calculation, say we, we cover those ecosystems, that's how much you pull out, and it would, it would outpace fossil fuel emissions. Um, anyway, sorry, I haven't written it up. I, I'd like to, I mean, as, a, as an academic and a scientist who used to job, a lot of my job used to be writing scientific papers, I'd love to do it. Um, 
Uh, you know, it's just things are so busy. But <laughs> yeah, one difficult question coming from the audience. So they're buying into what you're saying, but then they're a little bit worried about plastic. So we've had sessions, we are SDGs, so yes. like, what are you thinking about in terms of the, the way you package your food now and the way, so are you being okay. SDG about that? We are, we are extremely conscientious about that. Um, we, we are, um, we, so for example, our retail product, which is packaged and, and does have a plastic package, but we, we put it in a much less attractive package that is as close to a sphere, so to speak, as we could make it. So we minimize the amount of packaging, which is not the way that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, actually a square kind of block, but um, precisely to, to re reduce the amount of waste. And we're always trying to do that. I mean, it's, it's complicated because you have, to, you have to find the compromise of living within an ecosystem that just does not produce the stuff that, that you would like it to produce. But I just want to say one more thing about plastic weight. So one of our next products that we're going to hopefully launch in you know, a, a few years, if not sooner, um, is fish in various forms. Um, that we figured out a, a, a lot of the fundamentals of fish flavor and where it comes from naturally. Um, so that's important. Well, as you probably know, if you follow plastic pollution, probably half of the plastic in the ocean is fishing nets and fishing gear that have been discarded. It's not straws. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all for getting rid of plastic straws. But, but the real problem is these massive amounts of, of fishing nets and fishing gear that, that, that fall apart and get discarded in the ocean. And they're much worse. I mean, again, I'm, I am no fan of, of, of you know, plastic pollution, but, but it's the fishing industry is overwhelmingly the culprit here. And those are the plastic materials that trap animals and you know, drown whales and seal, seals and turtles. It's not, you know, uh, uh, not not that that other plastic waste isn't isn't critically important, but but that's the big problem. So, getting animals out of the food system doesn't solve everything, but it solves an awful lot. So, unfortunately, hey, we have to. Uh, could I ask you two quick questions? Very, but I know we're out of time. But. Uh, one is, uh, um, I know you're working on the healthfulness of the product from, yes. uh, for, in terms of the fats that you're using and sure. other things. So if you could say a word about that. And second, China. China is the biggest rise of meat consumption. Yes. But it's not at a, it, it could be uh, with awareness and so forth, uh, probably stabilized. So I don't know whether you've... Uh, so nutrition in China, okay, I, and I'll try to talk fast because I, I don't want to eat in, in anyone's time. So, um, you know, I, I'm an MD. I, I was a pediatrician for a number of years. Um, uh, I absolutely feel a huge responsibility to make our product as healthy and nutritious as possible. And we're constantly optimizing. We did not release the product until we felt like it was better for the consumer than what it replaced. It's not necessarily better than the, for the consumer than, you know, a, a giant pile of fresh vegetables, but the point is that the meat eaters are not going to are not going to accept a giant pile of fresh vegetables. We have to give it, make the healthiest product that delivers as meat. And um, so currently, our product is lower calorie, zero cholesterol, lower lower total fat, lower saturated fat, um, uh, same protein content, same bioavailable iron content. It's heme iron, which is the the kind of iron in meat that's efficiently absorbed, and so forth. But we're constantly, even right now, trying to improve it. So we, we did an upgrade of our, uh, uh, the burger that we launched with. Um, we removed wheat because of 2% of the population has, has gluten sensitivity. Um, so we got rid of that. We uh, lowered the salt. We lowered the calories. We lowered the total fat. We lowered the saturated fat. Uh, we improved the quality of the protein. Um, and also improve the flavor and, and stuff like that. And we're always going to do that. And, and, and even if we didn't care about nutrition, um, we would still do it because consumers care about nutrition. And we want a product that consumers choose over the animal product, so that's always going to be a priority. China is, is our biggest you know, international market by far, and always oh. has been. Um, we want to get uh, a launch in China as soon as we possibly can. The thing for China, which is, which is interesting, is I feel like from their national interest standpoint, we solve their biggest national security problem, which is that um, and it's, it's not African swine fever, although that's an exacerbation. It's that they're completely import dependent 
uh, for um, their meat supply because they have the lowest amount of arable land per capita, the lowest amount of fresh water per capita of any significant size developed country. And, um, and meat production is so land and water intensive that it just doesn't add up. But the technology that we use to produce our product, and you, could, you, could, you can do the math with the, the statistics that you, know, you can find online for us, is uses less than 1 25th of the land, a tenth of water, and less than a tenth of the fertilizer inputs, which is a big problem for China because of their water pollution problem. And they could produce their entire meat supply with half their arable land. So um, be completely self-sufficient, have sovereignty over their food system, wow. which is a big deal for China, um, and, um, and have much better food security because, um, and, and public health, because basically animal-based uh, meat production isn't just an environmental catastrophe, it's a public health catastrophe. It's China, you know, uh, uses more antibiotics than any other country pretty much in its meat supply. Um, if you ask public health people, what are, the, what are their nightmare scenarios? Number one, well, number one is an influenza pandemic or, or a major influenza epidemic that overwhelms our healthcare system. Um, if it's like 1918, which there's no reason why that's not ever gonna happen again, uh, it could kill 10% of the world's population in half a year. Um, that's number one. Uh, number two is basically multiple antibiotic resistant pathogens so that all the antibiotics we've spent decades developing are basically completely useless. Both of those things are, are nightmares. And they all trace back to uh, animal agriculture. Those an multiple antibiotic resistant uh, um, organisms are primarily due to massive use of antibiotics in a concentrated environment where you, it's just like a, 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 you know, these, these crowded environments where TB used to be communicated, you're, it's like a, an incubator for selecting antibiotic-resistant microorganisms. That's, number, that's, that's that problem. Every influenza epidemic in, in memory has started in a pig or poultry farm. They, 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 the new strains emerge when, when uh, flu strains that can infect humans, poultry, and swine in various combinations uh, come together and recombine and produce, produce a novel strain that we don't have immunity to. That's why the CDC has full-time staff camped in China basically collecting flu strains from pig and poultry farms because that's where the next disastrous epidemic that's the public health nightmare um, is going to begin and China's gonna feel it first. So um, anyway, there's all these reasons why I think it makes tremendous sense for China. Now we just have to convince them. Yeah. So we have to <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> compelling. Thank you, Pat, yeah, for being with us. Thank you. Fantastic. Oh, really great. I'll be back in touch with okay. you. Yeah.